The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, a collection of the final words from the sons of Jacob, exhorting their sons to walk in truth and in righteousness. Each patriarch has a unique message and perspective to share with the audience, containing unmistakable messianic prophecies and visions of end times revelation and impending judgment. The Testaments reflect some of the highest and noblest ethical teaching available and truly foreshadow many of Messiah's own precepts. The collection was preserved in Greek, Slavonic, Georgian, Serbian, Armenian, Venetian, and Latin. They were included in some canons, such as Armenian Orthodox, and were quoted by and alluded to through prominent early assembly writers, such as Origen and Jerome. Nevertheless, they are speculated by scholars to be pseudepigraphal and perhaps even Christian works. However, the avid researcher may be excited to know that the Dead Sea Scrolls findings included parts of Levi and Naphtali, dating to a minimum of 100 to 200 BC, thus lending credibility to the entire work. While we believe the Testaments to be inspired and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, it is up to you to test them and decide. With that being said, let's study together and show ourselves approved. Shabbat Shalom and welcome brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Testament of Twelve Patriarchs reading. This is the Testament of Issachar, a short but amazing testament that talks about single-mindedness versus double-mindedness, talking about laziness versus hard work and the reward that the Most High brings with that. I'm really excited to share this with you and really it's so interesting and very timely uh, with some of the conversations uh, and things that have been going on. So I'm really glad to, to, um, to be studying this together with you, and I pray that it will be a blessing for, uh, for all of us and we can grow together. So let's pray real quick. Father, Yahuwah Most High, we come before you and bless you and your son, Yahushua HaMashiach. And Father, we just thank you so much for sending your son. And Father, we just ask that you'd open our eyes and ears to hearing your word today that your Ruach would speak to us, Father, and that we can all be refined together, that we may be faithful hearers and doers at the return of Messiah, Yahushua, our amazing King of King, King of Kings, Father. We bless you, and uh, we thank you so much, and thank you for the Sabbath. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, so let's talk about this. Um, we're going to get into it. We're going to be reading the Testament of this card. We're going to be reading from the, uh, oh, I'll leave a link where you can read this for yourself. Um, there's many different places you can purchase this if you want to read this or have a physical copy for your own or for your own home. But uh, also you can read it online for free. And there's many available PDFs for free online if you want to read this. So uh, if you want to read along with me, let's do it. The Testament of Issachar, the fifth son of Jacob and Leah. So let's get into it. The copy of the words of Issachar. For he called his sons and said unto them, Hearken, my children, to Issachar your father, and give ear to the words of him who is beloved of Yahuwah. I was born the fifth son to Jacob, Jacob, by the way of hire for the mandrakes. For Reuben, my brother, brought in mandrakes from the field, and Rachel met him and took them. So let's pause there real quick. Let's read about the Genesis story, and then we can read the rest of this and get the full story. Because as I've mentioned before uh, in these studies and, of course, in our Torah portions, the Torah uh, gives us a brief account of, of kind of all these things that happen. If all the details were included in every single story, the Torah would be 10 to 15 times longer than it already is. So the most time gave us a a brief account of a lot of these things. But the person who likes to study and likes to know more information, I'm one of those people. I like reading these books and just getting the full story. So let's read about the Genesis account first. <clears throat> Genesis 30, 14 through 18. And Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. And Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray you, of your son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter that you have taken my husband? And would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. And Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in unto me, for surely I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. 
And Elohim hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, Elohim has given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my husband. And she called his name Issachar, which means uh, for hire or laborer or for, you know, for laborer for hire or something like that is the full full uh, meaning of it so that's the genesis account let's go back let's read this so again i was born the fifth son to jacob by way of hire for the mandrakes for reuben my brother brought in mandrakes from the field and rachel met him and took them and reuben wept and at his voice leah my mother came forth now these mandrakes were sweet smelling apples which were produced in the land of haran below a ravine of water and Rachel said, I will not give them to you, but they shall be to me instead of children. For Yahuwah has despised me, and I have not borne children to Jacob. Now there were two apples, and Leah said to Rachel, Let it suffice you what you have ta that you have taken my husband. Will you take these also? And Rachel said to her, You shall have Jacob this night for the mandrakes of your son. And Leah said to her, Jacob is mine, for I am the wife of his youth. But Rachel said, Boast not and vaunt not yourself, for he espoused me before you, and for my sake he served my father fourteen years. Just in case you're new to the, um, to all this and, and, and don't quite remember the story, um, Jacob uh, went to take a wife uh, from the daughters of Laban and wanted to marry Rachel. And Laban said, Okay, fine, work for me for, for seven years, and then you can have Rachel. And so he did, but Laban didn't give him Rachel at the wedding night, switched Rachel for Leah and gave him Leah instead. And when Jacob woke up, he was like, oh, it's Leah. And so anyways, he uh, ended up um, also with Rachel as well. But so this, this is kind of, the, that's kind of the backstory of this story. So, but Rachel said, boast not and vaunt not yourself for he espoused me before you. And for my sake, he served our father 14 years and had not craft increased on the earth and the wickedness of men prospered. You would not now see the face of Yaakov for you are not his wife, but in craft were taken to him in my stead. And my father deceived me and removed me on that night and did not suffer Jacob to see me. For had I been there, this had not happened to him. Nevertheless, for the mandrakes, I am hiring Jacob to you for one night. And Jacob knew Leah, and she conceived and bare me. And on account of the hire, I was called Issachar. Then appeared to Jacob an angel of Yahweh, saying, Two children shall Rachel bear, inasmuch as she has refused company with her husband and has chosen continency. And had not Leah my mother paid the two apples for the sake of his company, she would have borne eight sons. For this reason she bare six, and Rachel bare two. For on account of the mandrakes, Yahuwah visited her. For he knew that for the sake of the children she wished to company with Yaakov, and not for lust of pleasure. For on the morrow also she again gave up Yaakov because of the mandrakes. Therefore Yahuwah hearkened to Rachel. For though she desired them to eat these to eat these mandrakes, she ate them not, but offered them in the house of Yahuwah, presenting them to the priest of the Most High who was at that time. So we'll, we'll pause there real quick because uh, this is a kind of interesting interesting story because the mandrake itself has been made popular by uh, a certain uh, book series and um, movie series that features wizardry and the mandrake was uh, a living talking mandrake was in there. And so when you look at the mandrake, you're like, ooh, I don't know, because the mandrake itself uh, contains uh, hallucinogenic tropane alkaloids. Uh, and so this is like a... Anyways, and the shape of their roots often resembles human figures, and they have been associated with magic rituals throughout history, including present-day contemporary pagan traditions such as Wicca and Odinism, uh, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, sometimes the root can look like a piercing. You can see here like legs and stuff. And so not, not just because it's used in... Uh, magical occult ritual things that doesn't make automatically make this bad because well obviously the most high made it but you do ask yourself well you know what's up with this hallucinogenic thing why is this included here um, so if you read if you read up on on this it does this actually does have um, let's see it does have some benefits um, with uh, let's see it has it it says here somewhere it has benefits for um, incontinency or or um, it also has uh, benefits in um, healing. Um, oh, when someone's not able to have children, I'm, I'm the the word is escaping me. They're barren. Sorry, excuse me. When someone's barren, it has that. But there's also the uh, wild mandrake, 
which you know with the regular mandrake really the, the, the whole deal here is with the root but the wild mandrake um, is also called a mayapple, American mandrake, or wild mandrake, or ground lemon. Uh, it produces this little fruit that's like a little apple, and that's why they call it a mayapple. And the mayapple actually uh, also helps with um, barrenness as well. And then also, not that this is a huge deal, but I just, since we're reading the story, I thought it was kind of interesting. Here in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of Genesis chapter 30, it says, And Reuben went in the day of the barley harvest and found apples of mandrakes in the field and brought them unto his mother Leah. So anyways, uh, just a little side note. Um, but it is interesting as we're learning that the Most High has made amazing things in his creation that, uh, well, there's healings, there's natural healings and natural alternatives to the mainstream um, the mainstream m medical system that highlights um, pharmacia or, or pharmacy type drugs, whereas the Most High has his healings through the herbs of the earth. Uh, we learn in Genesis chapter 1 that the herb bearing seed is, is for food for us, for our benefit. We also learn in the book of Jubilees chapter 10 that um, the medicines of the earth are the herbs of the earth, and this is how the Most High heals. But of course, we also know that prayer fasting and seeking him that he's our healer and he can heal us of all things if you want to read up some more about that take a look at uh, the book of Sirach also known as Ecclesiasticus chapter 38 talks a lot more about healing through the herbs of the earth and of course not forsaking prayer because if we lean too much on uh, just the healing of the herbs or doctors themselves we learn about uh, the story of king asa in the bible who was an amazing king did great things but at the end of his life he had this foot disease and it said he trusted in the physicians and uh, was not ultimately healed so we have to always put our trust in the most high for all of our healing so if you're suffering out there with some sort of lingering disease um Consider the Most High's remedies through his herbs of the earth and through prayer and fasting, of course, and seeking him who is our healer. All right, so that's the little the backstory about the birth of Iskar. Now let's let's get into the meat of today's uh, tonight's study, which is about uh, hard work versus laziness, single-mindedness versus double-mindedness, uh, and, and many other things. So here we let's get into it. And uh, let me get my blue light blocking glasses. All right, here we go. So Testament of Iskar, chapter 1, verse 24. When therefore I grew up, my children, I walked in uprightness of heart, and I became a husbandman for my father and my brethren, and I have brought in the fruits from the field according to their season. So he was a gardener. And my father blessed me, for he saw that I walked in rectitude before him, and I was not a busybody in my doings, nor envious and malicious against my neighbor. Because as we'll find, the person who's busy with their work doesn't even have time to be a busybody or envious about other people. They're, they're, um, they're busy with, with, the, with their labors of their hands. Whether it be you know carpentry or, uh, or, or skilled labor or, or the many different uh, various um, fields of work today. But the person that's uh, that's busy and, and is not just sitting around um, without laboring, they don't have time to even do this. So so he's kind of showing us here that he became a husbandman. The father blessed him. He walked in rectitude and he was not a busybody in his doings, nor envious and malicious against my neighbor. I never slandered anyone, nor did I censor the life of any man walking as I did in the singleness of I. And we're going to be we're going to be talking a lot about singleness versus double-mindedness, and we're going to be talking about hard work and labor and the blessing that the Most High gives us versus people who are lazy and refuse to work because this is something that we have seen in this, um, uh, whatever this movement's called. And in case you're new and you're like, what movement are you talking about? We're talking about a movement of people who are like, you know what, the world is full of lies, and I don't believe them anymore, or we don't believe them anymore. We believe in the Most High, that he sent his son, and when he, we want to walk like he walked, and we believe the whole Bible is true uh, and edifying for our lives and good for for um, for doctrine and reproving and, and for general counsel and discipleship. And so what we found, what we're seeing is some people are coming out of the world and be like, well, since since work is working for the B system, I refuse to work. And people have become, some people have become lazy and refuse to work because they want to come out of the system. But coming out of the system 
doesn't mean that we don't labor anymore. And there's different types of labor. And some people have gotten themselves to a point where they have homesteads and they no longer have to work. And they, they rely on the toil, the sweat of their brow, uh, and eating the fruits of the ground and, and raising livestock and being able to be self-sustaining. And that's amazing. Are all of us there? Probably not. Probably 97, 98% of us are not there. So until we get there, we can't just stop working and be like, oh, you know, let's read about it. Let's read about it. Let's read about the importance of labor and the instruction that the scriptures give us according to it. Genesis 3, uh, 3, 17 through 19. And unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened to the voice of your wife and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. And let's just pause here for a second. Let's remember also in the garden, even before they were even kicked out, they were tilling the ground. They had They worked. So even in eternity, they're working. And when we look at uh, the promises of eternal life and we look at the promises of new Jerusalem, it says, I will bless the work of their hands and no more will someone else eat the, the labor of their hands. And so it's not like we're, you know, I don't know what most of us thought before coming into the truth and really reading scripture for ourselves. But I, I think maybe some of us thought that we'd be just be like hanging out on like clouds and rainbows and just sipping like heavenly cocktails. I, I don't know. What, what did people think? Um, anyways, that, that's for another time. But anyways, thorns and thistles shall I bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you are returned. But here's the problem. This is this is this is not a curse. He's like, this is how you're gonna live. You're gonna live by the sweat of the face, uh, uh, the sweat of your face, and you shall eat bread. This is how you're gonna live. Exodus 29 through 11, six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. In it, you shall not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days, Yahweh made the heaven and the earth. Six days he worked in the sea and all that is in, in them is and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and holiday. The reason I'm reading this is because a lot of us are waking up to the reality of the Sabbath. Well, if you have a Sabbath of rest, what are you doing in those six days? Just something to consider. Six days shall you do work in all your, your labor and all your work. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 12. Uh, here's, this is the, the bless, this is the blessings. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of Yahweh Elohim to observe, to do all his commandments, which I command, command you this day, that Yahweh Elohim will set you on high above all the nations. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, if you shall hearken to the voice of Yahweh Elohim. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. So in the field, of course, there's work to be done. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground. And the fruit of your cattle and the increase of your kind and the flocks of your sheep. This is all this all this stuff requires work. So he's gonna bless the work of your hands. He's not gonna just be like, you can sit around and just, you know, fruits and vegetables and you know, milk and cheese is just going to fall from the sky. He gives us, he blesses the work of our hands. Blessed shall be your basket and your store. Uh, anyways, and he keeps on, and he keeps on going, but the, the, this is the blessings. Deuteronomy 33, 11, bless Yahweh, his substance and accept the work of his hands. Proverbs 12, 11, he that tills his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that follows vain persons is void of understanding. Proverbs 12, 24, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful, the lazy, shall be under tribute. Proverbs 14, 23, in all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tends only to penury. And this is kind of what we see here is that he basically he's like, I, have, I became a hard worker and my father blessed me and I was not a busybody. And this is what this Proverbs is saying here. In all, your, in all labor, there is profit, but the talk of lips tends only to penury. Ecclesiastes 2.24, There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that was from the hand of Yahuwah. Ecclesiastes 3.13, And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of Elohim. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says, The sleep of of a laboring man is sweet. It's true. 
and there's more. There's actually a lot more. Uh, a couple other verses here from the book of Sirach. In case, you're, in case you're new, the book of Sirach, which is also known as Ecclesiasticus, was included in the 1611 KJV under the Apocrypha section. It was also included in many other canons. This was, uh, this was considered scripture for a long time. Uh, only in the last 150 years or so has this been removed as quote-unquote scripture. Sirach 715, do not hate toilsome labor or farm work which were created by the Most High. And this is not just talking about farming and uh, and, and, and um, um, husbandry. But of course, there's also so many other labors out there. There's, um, well, I can sit here and name them all off, but I mean, even just the basic skilled labor like carpentry and smithing and all these different things. These are all, these are all required for a city to be a city without it. And of course, there's many other uh, labor fields these days, but the, the point of this is work. You know, you could almost say, don't hate work. Sirach 10.27, better is a man who works and has an abundance of everything than one who goes about boasting but lacks bread. Anybody know people like that? Sirach 33.27, put him to work that he may not be idle, for idleness teaches much evil. Anybody ever heard the uh, the term out there? Um, what is it? Idle hands or the, the work of the... No. Well, I don't even know what that saying is. Uh, the idle hands are the devil's workshop or so I don't know what it means but seriously it says here for idleness teaches much evil so someone who's not laboring someone who's not working it can lead to to evil or to busy botting or envying or many many other things uh, so let's talk about some of the New Testament verses uh, also that really expound on this and this this gets pretty deep here. 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, we'll start at verse 6. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our master, Yahusha Hamashiach, that you keep away from every brother or sister who leads a disorderly life and not one in accordance with the tradition which you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined way among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to you, to any of you, not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a role model for you so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we have heard, for we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. And so you can see that's the same correlation we see here with Issachar. Hey, I became a hard worker. I was blessed and I was not a busybody. Here we see in here that there's some people not doing any work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now we command and exhort such persons in Yahusha HaMashiach, to work peacefully and to eat their own bread. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary of doing good. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person so as not to associate with him, so that he will be put to shame. And yet do not regard that person as an enemy, but admonish that one as a brother or sister. So correct them and say, hey, look, listen, you're not supposed to be living an idle life. You're not supposed to be just sitting around and expecting everyone to feed you. Each person is required to do their work. Now, of course, there's special cases of people who are handicapped and, and cannot work or uh, the, the old or, or uh, there's, there's, of course, those people need to be taken care of. But the, the typical person that has the ability to work needs to work. And that's Torah. Proverbs 26, 13 to 17. A lazy one says there is a lion in the road. A lion is in the public square as the door turns on its hinges. So. So does a lazy one in his bed. A lazy one buries his hand in the dish. He is weary of bringing it to his mouth again. A lazy one is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who can give a discreet answer. And this is, I've seen this. I've seen this. Lazy, you know, a lazy person is just smarter than anybody. He has it all figured out and won't, and a lot of times won't receive correction. Like one who takes a dog by the ears, so is one who passes by and meddles with strife not belonging to him. Proverbs 19.15, laziness casts one into a deep sleep, and a lazy person will suffer hunger. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12. And by the way, in case you're like, oh, he's going so fast, I can't write all these scriptures down, I'll have a link in the description box for a link for a study guide to have that I'll have all these scriptures for you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we instructed you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and be not in any need. Proverbs 21, 25 through 26, the desire of the lazy one puts him to death for his hands refuse to work all day long. He is craving while the righteous gives and does not hold back. Ephesians 4, 27 through 29, and do not give the devil an opportunity. The one who steals must no longer steal, period, but rather he must labor, producing with his hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that so that it will be give. I'm sorry. I must have messed up here. But if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that so that it will give grace to those who hear. So just some scriptures I wanted to share with you about hard work versus laziness. The hard work is blessed. With, the hard worker is blessed with shalom. Uh, the lazy one is troubled with a burdensome mind. A troublesome mind. Burdened with a troublesome mind. So let's keep reading. So I was not a busybody in my doings, nor envious and malicious against my neighbor. I never slandered anyone, nor did I censor the life of any man walking as I did in singleness of eye. We're going to be talking about singleness here in just a minute. Therefore, when I was 35 years old, I took myself a wife, for my labor wore away my strength, and I never thought upon pleasure with women, but owing to my toil, sleep overcame me. And my father always rejoiced in my rectitude because I offered through the priest to Yahuwah all first fruits, then to my father also. And Yahuwah increased 10,000 fold his benefits in my hand. And also Yaakov, my father, knew that Elohim aided my singleness. Now, I think, <clears throat> I think Issachar, the Testament Issachar, gives us some of the best instruction of single-mindedness versus double-mindedness. A lot of us know the passage in the book of James that talks about uh, that Elohim does not give to a double-minded man. But there's, there's, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of instruction of single-mindedness of double-mindedness. At least it's not, it doesn't seem to be very surface, surface clear. Surface clear is the wrong word. Um, it doesn't seem to be, um, well, Let's clarify. How about this? Let's just clarify single-mindedness versus double-mindedness. Let's read that passage in James first. James, a bondservant of Elohim and of the master, Yahushua HaMashiach, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's why you're being tested. You're like, why is my life so hard in the sense I've come to the truth? That's why. Stick with it. But if any of you lacks wisdom, here it comes. Let him ask of Elohim, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that person ought not to expect that he will receive anything from from Yahuwah, being a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. And so we can see here, of course, double-mindedness has something to do with faith, uh, either having faith or or not having faith, which is, of course, doubting, tossed by the wind. And this is it, this kind of reminds me of uh, what Messiah says, be not like a reed shaken in the wind. Don't be moved around by every single doctrine out there. We're in the times of deception, and the deception doesn't just come from the news agencies and, and the governments and the, the people that, you know, the quote-unquote elites that have all these programs and uh, schools and whatever deception also comes from within people who say they are uh, servants of of the most high servants of messiah even people in that say you know torah observant so we can't be shaken up we have to test everything that people say and including myself everything that i'm sharing with you here um test it test it by the word test it by prayer and, and if it's if it seems to be at a really big crossroads in your life it tested by prayer and fasting but let's talk about double-mindedness. Psalm 119, 113, 15 says, I hate those 
who are double-minded, but I love your law. I love your Torah. Let's look at this word here. Um, we're reading, this is the, I think the NASB. Is this the NASB? Yeah, we're reading the NASB. Uh, let's take a look at what the, the uh, Hebrew says here. So the Hebrew word there for double-mindedness is se'ep. Ambivalent, divided, half-hearted, a skeptic, divided in mind. Ambivalent. I want to look at that word ambivalent. Ambivalent. Uh, undecided as to whether or not to take a proposed course of action, having feelings of both for and against the proposed action. Simultaneously experiencing or expressing opposing or or contradictory feelings, beliefs, or motivations. So, really, double-minded. It's like, hmm, yeah, maybe, yeah, yes, no, uh, yeah, uh, no, hmm, ah. Uh. I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your law. And you can, of course, we'll, we'll see here that being single-minded is those who love his law. So, the opposite of being double-minded, in, uh, in a large sense, is one who's convinced of walking in the law of the Most High. And I just, I like these next passages. So they're, they're a little off topic, but we're going to read them anyways. You are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Leave me, you evildoers, so that I may comply with the commandments of my Elohim. 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of Yahuwah and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of Yahuwah and the table of demons. You can't have one foot in, one foot out. You can't do it. You can't be like, I'm going to serve Yah and I'm going to serve, you know, the world. That's what happened. That's what that's what Elijah was uh, rebuking uh, the Israelites on top of Mount Carmel. How long will you be between two opinions? If Baal is Elohim, serve him. But if Yahweh is Elohim, serve him. And that was what you went up to prove there, that Yah is Elohim. And so they're like, after the fire consumed the, the offering from, miraculously from heaven, they're like, Yahuwah, he is Elohim. Psalm 12. Help, Yahuwah. For the godly person has come to an end, for the faithful have disappeared from the sons of mankind. They speak lies to one another. They speak with flattering lips and a double heart. So double mind, double heart, probably something pretty similar here. Let's take a look at double heart. <clears throat> well, it says it's double heart. So the heart we know is the inner man, the mind, the will, understanding, um, knowledge, thinking, reflection, memory, inclination, resolution, determined will. Um, this is the seat of emotions and passions. So are we single-minded about Yah in our, uh, in our understanding of Him, in our pursuit of Him, in our soul, in our mind, our thinking of Him, our reflection of Him, our inclination towards Him and His ways? Or are we double-minded? So again, verse 2 of Psalm 12, They speak lies one to another. They speak with flattering lips and a double heart. May the Yahuwah cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said, With our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is master of us? Because of the devastation of the poor, because of the groaning of the needy, now will I arise, says Yahuwah. Now will I put him in the safety for which he longs. The words of Yahuwah are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, filtered seven times. You Yahweh will keep them. You will protect him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of mankind. So there's a quick look into single-mindedness versus double-mindedness. And, and let's also, we, we were talking about it, it's one foot in, one foot out. Serving him and serving the world. One foot in, one foot out. This is someone who's not sold out for Yah. That is not making him their primary focus. Revelation three fourteen through 19. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Elohim. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. Choose a side. Choose. Don't be half in, half out. Don't be half-hearted. Don't be double-minded. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, will I spew you out of my mouth because you say I'm rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And be single-minded. Be single-minded. Because the doubter will not be protected. The doubter will not enter into New Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 7 through 8, He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his Elohim, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, these are people who are double-minded. Because if you're cowardly, you don't really trust in him. If you're faithless, you're a doubter, and you're double-minded. The polluted, as for murderers, fornicator, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. None of us want to be there. So we got to clean up our act. Here's a good passage about trusting in him versus not trusting him. This is single-mindedness versus double-mindedness. Let's talk about single-mindedness. My son, if you come forward to serve Yahuwah, prepare yourself for temptation or trials or tribulations set your heart right and be steadfast and do not be hasty in time of calamity cleave to him and do not depart that you may be honored at the end of your life listen to this accept whatever is brought upon you and in changes that humble you be patient think about joseph i talk about him a lot but think about joseph he didn't deserve what he got he was in prison but you know what he was faithful and he, did, and he was faithful with what was dealt to him. He accepted whatever was brought upon him. And in changes that humble you, be patient. He was. And he worked hard for, he worked hard for Potiphar, which he didn't even deserve to be there. He worked diligently in the jail and became, he rose up to become the, the head of all the slaves. And that reminds me of the passage that, that Paul says that uh, whatever you do, whatever you work, whatever your occupation is, do it unto Yahweh. Don't, don't, don't do it for your, your employer, but do it unto Yah. If you're a janitor, be the best janitor that there is. If whatever your profession is, even if you think it's so insignificant, do it unto him with all of your heart and see what Yah will do with that. Accept whatever is brought upon you. Oh, poor me. Poor me, I was brought up in this situation and I, this, I have this happen to me and that happened to me and, and here I am and just woe is me. Accept whatever is brought upon you and in changes that humble you, be patient and work hard and work diligently unto Yahuwah and be single-minded about him. For gold is tested in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. Trust in him and he will help you. That's a single-minded person. Make your way straight and hope in him. That's having faith. You who fear Yahuwah, wait for his mercy and turn not aside lest you fall. You who fear Yahuwah, trust in him and your reward will not fail. You who fear Yahuwah, hope for good things, for everlasting joy and mercy. Consider the ancient generations and see who ever trusted in Yahuwah and was put to shame, or who ever persevered in the fear of Yahuwah and was forsaken, or who ever called upon him and was overlooked. For Yahuwah is compassionate and merciful. He forgives sins and saves in times of affliction. Think about this, about the hard worker for a second. The single-minded hard worker, diligent, who accepts whatever's brought upon him and does it and does his work cheerfully and does it unto Yah. Think about what kind of witness you can be to people around you. Think about it for a second. Are you just going to go through and be like everyone else in your work environment, whatever you do? Or are you going to stand out and be like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do the, I'll, I'll do the hard job that nobody wants, boss. I'll take the rough shift that nobody wants. I'll help out. I'll pitch in, boss. What's what's up with you? What, why why are you so why are you so willing to help all of a sudden? Why are you so uh, what's what's this about? Well, because I saw this passage uh, that says whatever you do, do it unto Yah, and I love Yah, and I want to do my job the best that I can, and I want to I want to please Him, and I want to serve Him, whatever it is. I'm just saying we can be a really good example. We could be just, you know, in your work environment is an amazing place to be a light. Woe to timid hearts and to slack hands. And to the, you know, so now we're talking about, so we, we talked about the, the single minded person. Now you're going to see there's a shift here, the double minded person. Woe to timid hearts. That's someone's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if, if he's the most high, if he's going to help me or if like, uh, if he's going to let me fall. Uh, woe to timid hearts and to slack hands and to the sinner who walks along two ways, the double mindedness. That's the person who's got one foot in, one foot out who wants to walk in the path of Yah and also walk in the path of the world. Woe to the faint heart, for it has no trust. Therefore, it will not be sheltered. Woe to you who have lost your endurance. 
Remember Paul said, run the race with patience, with endurance. What will you do when Yahweh punishes you? Those who fear Yahweh will not disobey his words, and those who love him will keep his ways. Those who fear Yahweh will seek his approval, and those who love him will be filled with the law. The Torah, just in case you're new, you're like, what's all this talk about commandments and law? I have been told that the law is done away with. And we'll talk about that, and please stick with us. We'll talk about that at the end. Those who fear Yahuwah will prepare their hearts and will humble themselves before him. Let us fall into the hands of Yahuwah, but not into the hands of men. For as his majesty is, so also is his mercy. Praise Yah. <clears throat> All right, let's uh, let's keep going. Let's. I want to show. I want to share with you a story that shows the single-minded man versus the double-minded man. The man that believes versus the man that, well, maybe even half believes. Because this whole single-mindedness versus double-mindedness is not even talking about believers. Believers are zero-minded. Single-minded person is fully convinced, fully trusts, fully walks in his ways. The double-minded person maybe walks in the, his path and maybe walks a little bit in the world. Maybe um, is, is convinced to keep the commandments, but, you know, maybe on some of these other commandments, we're like, well, you know, I'll do the best I can, you know. The single-minded per person says, Yah's going to deliver me. The double-minded man is like, well, he, uh, he may deliver me, he may not. I'll just see how this goes. There's a story in the uh, ancient book of Yashar, also known as Jasher, or Jayashar, however you pronounce it. Yeah, the book of Yashar, Jasher, was uh, mentioned in the book of Joshua, chapter 10, verse 13. Are these things not written in the book of Jasher? Also in 2 Samuel 1, 18, are these things not written in the book of Jasher? Some people will say, this is not the book of Jasher that's talking about. After much study and much prayer, um, I believe this is the book of Jasher that's written in the in the Bible. There's, there's so many connections, so many confirmations, but hey, it's for you to test. There's a lot of people out there that speak against this book. Um, me, in my house, we believe this is a true book. And I'd love to share with you an amazing story in this book about Abraham and Haran and an amazing thing that happened in the Ur of the Kazdim. This is something that's not in the, Gen in the book of Genesis. This happens uh, before Abraham comes out of the land uh, where I was like, come, come out of your, your father's house and come to a land, you know. So this, is, this happens right before that. And it's an amazing story. And I believe that the Most High kept this here for people who really want to seek. This is... a. Uh, and it says, and when the king heard that, this is talking about King Nimrod and his, um, and his nation. And when the king heard the words of Abram, he ordered him to be put in prison. Abram had just finished reproving him. Like, hey, why are you serving these dumb idols? Don't you know that the flood came upon the world because of these things and wickedness? And your nation is full of wickedness and you need to stop serving these idols and you start, start serving Yah. And when the king heard the words of Abraham, he there's much more than that. He ordered him to be put in prison, and Abram was in was ten days in prison. Reminds me of what it says in the book of Revelation: "You shall be in prison ten days." And at the end of those days, the king ordered that all the kings, princes, and governors of different provinces and the sages should come before him. And they sat before him, and Abram was still in the house of confinement. And the king said to the princes and sages, "Have you heard what Abram, the son of Terah, has done to his father?" What he did to his father is he went in his father's uh, house and chopped down all of his uh, his um, images, his graven images, with an axe. Thus has he done to him, and I ordered him to be brought before me, and thus has he spoken. His heart did not misgive him, neither did he stir in my presence. He wasn't afraid of me. And behold, now he is confined in the prison. And therefore decide what judgment is due to this man who reviled the king, who spoke and did all the things that you have heard. And they all answered the king, saying, The man who reviles the king should be hanged upon a tree. But having done all the things that he said, and having despised our Elohim, he must therefore be burned to death, for this is the law in this manner. If it pleases the king to do this, let him order his servants to kindle a fire both night and day in your brick furnace, and then we will cast this man into it. And the king did so, and he commanded his servants that they should prepare a fire for three days and three nights in the king's furnace, that is, in Kazdim, the Ur of the Kazdim, Ur of the Chaldees. And the king ordered them to take Abram from prison and bring him out to be burned. And all the king's servants, princes, lords, governors, and judges, and all the inhabitants of the land, about 900,000 men, stood opposite the furnace to see Abram. Can you imagine that? Almost a million people out there getting ready to watch this. 
And all the women and little ones crowded upon the roofs and towers to see what was doing with Abram. And they all stood together at a distance, and there was not a man left that did not come on that day to behold the scene. And when Abram was come, the conjurers of the king and the sages saw Abram. And they cried out to the king, saying, Our sovereign master, surely this is the man whom we know to have been the child at whose birth the great star swallowed the four stars, which we declared to the king now fifty years since. Quick, quick story. Uh, Abraham was born with a sign in the heavens in the stars, and the 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 wise men of uh, Nimrod knew that by this sign that Abram was the one that was to be born that would take over and destroy this nation. And uh, Nimrod ordered Abram to, to come and be killed. Terah, his father, like was like, I don't want him to be. So instead of bringing Abram, he brought um, uh, another baby that was born in his house to one of his servants and brought that to Nimrod, and they killed that baby. And Nimrod was like cool crisis averted and now behold his father has also transgressed your commands and mocked you by bringing you another child which you did kill and when the king heard their words he was exceedingly wroth and he ordered Terah to be brought before him and the king said have you heard what the conjurers have spoken now tell me truly how did you and if you shall speak the truth you shall be acquitted and seeing that the king's anger was so much kindled, Terah said to the king, uh, my, my lord and king, you have heard the truth, and what the sages have spoken is right. And the king said, how could you do this thing to transgress my orders and give me a child that you did not beget and take value for him? And Terah answered the king, because my tender feelings were excited for my son at that time, and I took a son of my handmaid and brought him to the king. And the king said, who advised you to do this? Tell me, do not hide aught from me, and then you shall not die. And Terah was greatly terrified in the king's presence. And he said to the king, It was Haran, my eldest son, who advised me to do this. And Haran was in those days that Abram was born two and thirty years old. But Haran did not advise his father to anything, for Terah said this to the king in order to deliver his soul from the king. For he feared greatly. And the king said to Terah, Haran, your son, who advised you to this, shall die through fire with Abram. For the sentence of death is upon him for having rebelled against the king's desire in doing this thing. And Haran at that time felt inclined to follow the ways of Abram, but he kept it within himself. It reminds me of uh, some of the Pharisees that believed in our Messiah, but kept it to themselves, lest they should be kicked out of the um, uh, the synagogues because... Um, they looked for the their what was it because they loved the praise of men and not that of Elohim. And Haran said in his heart, "Now here, here, now we're looking at the heart and the innards of a double-minded man." And Haran said in his heart, "Behold, now the king has seized Abram on account of these things which Abram did, and it shall come to pass that Abram, if Abram prevail over the king, I will follow him. But if the king prevail, I will go after the king." This is a double-minded man. And when Terah had spoken this to the king concerning Haran his son, the king ordered Haran to be seized with Abram. And they brought them both, Abram and Haran his brother, to cast them into the fire. And all the inhabitants of the land and the king's servants and princes and all the women and the little ones were, were there standing that day over them. And the king's servants took Abram and his brother, and they stripped them of their clothes except their lower garments which were upon them. And they bound their hands and feet with linen cords. And the servants of the king lifted them up and cast them both into the furnace. And Yahuwah loved Abram, and he had compassion over him. And Yahuwah came down and delivered Abram from the fire, and he was not burned, much like um, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. But all the cords with which they bound him were burned, while Abram remained and walked about in the fire. And Haran died when they had cast him into the fire, and he was burned to ashes. For his heart was not perfect with Yahuwah. He was double-minded and not single. And those men who cast him into the fire, the flame of the fire spread over them, and they were burned, and twelve men of them died. And Abram walked in the midst of the fire three days and three nights. And all the servants of the king saw him walking in the fire, and they came and told the king, saying, Behold, we have seen Abram walking about in the midst of the fire, and even the lower garments which are upon him are not burned, but the cord with which he was bound is burned. And when the king heard their words in his in his, I'm sorry, when the king heard their words, his heart fainted, and he would not believe them. So he sent other faithful princes to see this matter. And they went and saw it and told the king, and the king rose to go see it. And he saw Abram walking to and fro in the midst of the fire. And he saw Haran's body burned, and the king wondered greatly. And the king ordered Abram to be taken out of the fire, and his servants approached to take him out, and they could not, for the fire was round about, and the flame ascending toward them from the furnace. And the king's servants fled from it. And the king rebuked them, saying, Make haste and bring Abram out of the fire, that you shall not die. 
And the servants of the king again approached to bring Abram out, and the flames came upon them and burned their faces, so that eight of them died. And when the king saw that his servants could not approach the fire lest they should be burned, the king called to Ab Abram, O servant of Elohim who is in heaven, go forth from amidst the fire and come hither before me. And Abram hearkened to the voice of the king, and he went forth from the fire and came and stood before the king. And when Abram came out, the king and all his servants saw Abram coming before the king with his lower garments upon him, for they were not burned, but the cord with which he was bound was burned. And the king said to Abram, How is it that you were not burned in the fire? And Abram said to the king, The Elohim of heaven and earth in whom I trust in all and who has all in his power, he delivered me from the fire into which you did cast me. And Haran, the brother of Abram, was burned to ashes, and they sought for his body, and they found it consumed. And Haran was eighty-two years old when he died in the fire of Kazdim. And the king, princes, and inhabitants of the land, seeing that Abram was delivered from the fire, they came and bowed down to Abram. And Abram said to them, Do not bow down to me, but bow down to the Elohim of the world who made you, and serve him, and go in his ways, for it is he who delivered me from out of this fire, and it is he who created the souls and spirits of all men, and formed men in his mother's womb, and brought him forth into this world, and it is he who will deliver you those who trust in him from all pain. And this thing seemed very wonderful in the eyes of the king and princes that Abram was saved from the fire and that Haran was burned. And the king gave Abram many presents, and he gave him two his two head servants from the king's house, the name of the one was Onai, and the name of the other was Eliezer. And of all the kings and princes and servants gave Abram many gifts of silver and gold and pearl, and the king and his princes sent him away, and he went in peace. And Abram went forth from the king in peace, and many of the king's servants followed him. About three hundred men joined him. And Abram returned on that day and went to his father's house. And he and all the men that followed him, and Abram served Yahuwah Elohim, his Elohim all the days of his life. And he walked in all his ways and followed in his law, his Torah. And from that day forward, Abram inclined the hearts of the sons of men to serve Yahuwah. And there's more interesting story, though. I just wanted to share with you. That's the difference between a man who's fully sold out to Yah and believes and trusts in him no matter what. And think about all the think about all the the great men and women of of, of the scriptures who trusted him in in somewhat in sometimes just impossible scenarios impossible odds but trusted him and were steadfast and were willing to even give up their lives and were saved and were delivered and that's what happened here and that's the difference between someone who is like i'm totally fully committed fully believing and someone who's just like you know, maybe. Well, I'll, I'll, I want to follow his ways, and, and and I know this is true, but you know, one foot in, one foot out, kind of thing. And this is something for us to to really evaluate our life, whether we're walking in singleness of mind, singleness of heart, or double mindedness or double hearted. And, and we're going to learn more about double heartedness in the Book of Asher, about the motives behind why we do things. It's like we can follow the the ways, but if their motives are bad. Still not good. So anyways, that I want to give you kind of a basis of single-mindedness versus double-mindedness. And now we'll continue to read chapter 1 of Issachar, and we'll read more about single-mindedness. So back here, chapter 1, verse 30. And Yahweh increased 10,000-fold his benefits in my hand. And also Yaakov, my father, knew that Elohim guided my singleness. For on all the poor and oppressed, I bestowed the good things of the earth in the singleness of my heart. So he gave them. So being single-minded, of course, is following his law. Following his law means to help the poor. And he helped them for the right reason, the singleness of his heart. And now, hearken to me, my children, and walk in singleness of your heart. For I have seen it in all that is well-pleasing to Yahuwah. So I've seen that in it. All that is well-pleasing to Yahuwah. So when we walk in singleness of heart to him, it's well-pleasing to him. Now listen, the single-minded man covets not gold. So he's not a lover of money. Sure, we need money because money buys things, but he's not a lover of it. He overreaches not his neighbor. He longs not after manifold dainties. He delights not in varied apparel. He does not desire to live a long life, but only waits for the will of Elohim. This reminds me, all right here it says, Longs not after manifold dainties, delights not in varied apparel, which this world tells people, sells people that that's that's the great you know, um, that's the part of the American dream you know is just having this wardrobe that's just vast and all these kind of things. Matthew six twenty four through thirty three. No man can serve two masters, right? 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You can't serve God or Elohim and mammon or money. There's a difference of having money and serving money. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, right? They don't they don't sow seeds to, to uh, bring up plants for them to eat. Neither do they reap, nor do they gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto a stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Why do you care about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if Elohim so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you, a little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we be clothed with? For after all these things do the nations seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Listen, but seek ye first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Don't worry about it. Seek him first. Seek his righteousness first. And all these things will be taken care of. Don't worry about it. He does not desire to live. So back to the Testament of Issachar chapter 1. He does not desire to live a long life, but only waits for the will of Elohim. And the spirits of deceit have no power against him. For he looks not on the beauty of women, lest he should pollute his mind with corruption. There is no envy in his thoughts. No malicious person makes his soul to pine away, nor worry with insatiable desire in his mind. This is that like restless mind, like, oh my goodness. There's no envy in his thoughts. Like, oh, this person has this and this person has that and this person ha has more than that. No malicious person makes his soul to pine away. So even if there's these evil people around him, it doesn't like, it doesn't bother him. Nor worry with insatiable desire in his mind. For he walks in the singleness of soul and beholds all things in uprightness of heart, shunning eyes made evil through the error of the world, lest he should see the perversion of any of the commandments of Yahuwah. This is why it says, love not the world, neither, neither the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of the eyes, is not of the Father. I messed up that last part, but you, I, you, I think you know that passage what I'm talking about. Keep therefore my children, listen, and this is this is part of the, the singleness. Keep therefore my children the law, the Torah of Elohim, and get singleness. Walking in his law is singleness. And walk in guilelessness, not playing the busy body with the business of your neighbor, but love Yahuwah and your neighbor and have compassion on the poor and the weak. There's a, when it comes to taking care of the poor and the weak or just the needy in general, um, there's a passage in 2 Ezra chapter 2, verses 20 through 23 that I really love. If you're not familiar, this is also just like um, Book of Sirach was uh, once included in uh, the, the Bible, the canon, but was taken out in the mid-1800s. Guard the rights of the widow. Secure justice for the fatherless. Give to the needy. Defend the orphan. Clothe the naked. Care for the injured and the weak. Do not ridicule a lame man. Protect the maimed. And let the blind man have a vision of my splendor. Protect the old and the young within your walls. And when you find any who are dead, commit them to the grave and mark it. And I will give you the first place in my resurrection. Great passage. B back to Testament of Issachar chapter 1, verse 39. Bow down your back unto husbandry and toil in labors in all manner of husbandry, offering the gifts of Yahuwah with thanksgiving. For with the first fruits of the earth will Yahweh bless you, even as you blessed all the saints from Abel even until now. For no other portion is given to you than the fatness of the earth, whose fruits are raised by toil. We'll take a look at the uh, uh, the Septuagint, the Greek um, version of Genesis 49, 14 through 15. This is to Issachar. Issachar has desired that which is good, resting between the inheritances. And having seen that the resting place, that it was good, and the land, that it was fertile, he subjected his shoulder to labor and became a husbandman. So that's what he's talking about here. For our father Yaakov blessed me with the blessings of the earth and of the first fruits. And Levi and Judah were glorified by Yahweh even among the sons of Yaakov, for Yahweh gave them an inheritance. And to Levi he gave the priesthood, and to Judah the kingdom. And so you think about like even Levi, you know, 
and so what I'm, what I was trying to what I'm trying to say here is that there's more than just farming and and husbandry and raising being a shepherd raising livestock. There's many different employments. Even for Levi, Levi was given the charge of the tabernacle, the service of the temple, um, and they were given the first they were given the, the tithes and the first fruits so that because the Yah knew that they were occupied in his Torah and teaching the Torah, instructing the people, doing the sacrifices, doing the offerings, uh, taking care of, of the temple itself. And so that, so they had their version of work. So their version of work wasn't, uh, um, you know, farming and, and husbandry, those kind of things. And my point is, is that we all have different appointing, especially, uh, let's just fast forward to New Jerusalem. We know there's, there's plenty of scripture that says we're, we're going to work there. And so there'll be different types of labors and things like that. So have much more even now for a society, even if we start to start living in communities, whatever. Not everybody has to do the same thing. It takes an array of laborers to make the community thrive. So the point is, is even though Issachar is focusing on gardening and husbandry, there's uh, the, the overall lesson of what we're talking about today is being diligent in whatever work that we have. And to Judah he gave the kingdom. And do you therefore obey them and walk in the singleness of your father? For unto Gad has it been given to destroy the troops that are coming upon Israel. Let's talk about, let's go to chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Chapter 2 of Issachar. Know ye therefore, my children, that in the last time your sons will forsake singleness and will cleave unto insatiable desire. Let's go back real quick to chapter 1 verse 33 remember the single-minded man covets not gold he overreaches not his neighbor he longs not after manifold dainties and he delights not in varied apparel let's go back here so chapter 2 know you therefore my children that in the last times your son will your sons will forsake singleness and will cleave unto insatiable desire insatiable means not able to be satisfied and so this is why the book of proverbs says the the, the I think it's Proverbs says that the man who loves money will not be satisfied by it. Something like that. I'm, I'm messing that up. But I've seen that with my own my own hands. I worked directly underneath a millionaire who had all, it would seem to me, all the money in the world. But for him, it was never enough. And he would penny pinch customers making thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars upon in on, on these different jobs he, he owned a, a very successful construction company but he would penny pinch customers over like 50 bucks or or 100 bucks or 500 bucks and, and like just literally just steal from them and it's just like no amount of money would ever would ever i just that was like the most plainly I ever saw that no amount of money would ever satisfy somebody and that's why you have these <clears throat> famous people musicians um, actors, whatever, that, that have all the money and are just still depressed, suicidal, because they've reached it. And they're like, now what? I've got it all. I've got all the toys. I've got the houses. I've got the cars. I've got the boats. And I'm still miserable. Why? It's because they're missing out on this. They're missing out on the Most High. They're missing out on salvation through His Son. They're missing out on the peace of mind that we like the, the passage we read earlier in Proverbs um, the diligent worker sleeps peacefully or has restful sleep that's also the person that walks in the most ways has peace in their heart it's part of the, the fruits of the spirit love, joy, peace joy in their heart that even though they might be going through the hardest time in their life it's like praise yeah hallelujah and leaving guilelessness will draw near to malice, forsaking the commandments of Yahuwah. So the person who leaves singleness leaves and forsakes the commandments of Yahuwah. They will cleave unto Belier. Belier in this book is the name for Satan. And leaving hus husbandry, they will follow after their own wicked devices, and they shall be dispersed among the nations and shall serve their enemies. And do you therefore give these commands to your children that if they sin, they may the more quickly return to Yahuwah, for he is merciful and will deliver them, even bringing them back into their land. And this is the, this is the same this is the same words in the New Testament, as they say. First John 2 says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not, period. What sin? So he says that you sin not. Well, what is sin? 
Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, the Torah, for sin is the transgression of the law, the Torah, period. So that you, I write these things unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahushua HaMashiach, the righteous. And he is the propitiation or atonement for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Unfortunately, the whole world won't accept of this uh, atonement because of the hardness of their heart. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he that said, and, and some people will teach, well, these are a different set of commandments. This is not the old Mosaic law, the Old Testament law. I'm here to say that that's false. And John will tell you here that in a second. He that says, I know him, I know him, and keeps not his commandments is a liar. Maybe maybe not on purpose, but the, but the, the text says that he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keeps his word in him verily is the love of Elohim perfected. We know verses like love fulfills the law. Well, so who keeps his word? Who keeps his commandment? Verily, the love of Elohim is perfected. That's how we perfect love. And hereby know that we are in him. He that says, I abide in him, or I live in Messiah, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. And this is where we need to retake, re-examine the Gospels and look at how he walked. And you'll see that he was obedient to the, the commandments. He was obedient to the Torah in every way. The only thing that he transgressed, the only thing that he um, openly transgressed was the commandments of men, commandments that the Most High never commanded, commandments that, that men created on top of the law or even in place of the law. Like, example, like he... Um, he healed on the Sabbath day. Guess what? There's no law that says you can't heal on the Sabbath day. He, uh, he, he walked through the field and picking grain. Man says you can't do that. But guess what? The, the Torah of the Most High says you can. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. So just you're like, hey, this is the new law. This is the new law of Christ. No. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. So nothing new. Nothing new here, folks. Anyways, back to um, Testament of Issachar, chapter 2, verse 5. Behold, therefore, as ye see, I am 126 years old and am not conscious, conscious of committing any sin. What? Stop the record player. I thought we were all taught that the law is so hard, nobody can do it. Nobody was able to do it so that Messiah had to come so that he could do it and do it for you. Anybody ever heard that? Well, this says otherwise. Let's keep reading. I am not conscious of committing any sin, except my wife. I have not known any woman. I never committed fornication by the uplifting of my eyes. I drank not wine to be led astray thereby. He's not saying that wine is sin, but we know that wine can lead to that. People who are inappropriate that. If you didn't watch the Testament of Judah, we talk quite a bit about wine and what the scriptures actually say about it. I drank not wine to be led astray thereby. I coveted not any desirable thing that was my neighbor's. Guile arose not in my heart. A lie passed not through my lips. If any man were in distress, I joined my sighs with him. And I shared my bread with the poor. I wrought godliness. All my days I kept truth. Psalm 119, 142 says the Torah is the truth. I loved Yahweh, likewise also every man with all my heart. So do you also these things, my children, and every spirit of Belial or Satan shall flee from you, and no deed of wicked men shall rule over you. So let's talk about this. Like what Esgar said, he would walk perfectly. I thought we were taught in church. In, in uh, I didn't grow up in church, but most of you have told me that when you grow up in church is that Messiah was the only one that's ever been able to keep the law, keep all of it. The New Testament even says otherwise. Luke 1, 5 through 6. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before Elohim. Listen, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahuwah, blameless. Think about it. That's what the scripture says. That's not what I say. That's what the scripture says. We just read Issachar. There's two witnesses there of people who kept the law. So I have a question. If if the Most High, if the Most High gave the Israelites a law that nobody could keep, then we're then we would be implying that he is a unfair unfair Elohim. He's an unfair God, an unfair judge. If he were to give them a law that they could not keep. And I'll tell you, I'll explain why. Because that's essentially what people are saying. Nobody could keep the law and therefore he had to come and do the law for us because we can't do it. That's what people teach. That's not what I believe. And I'd like to prove that to you through scripture today. 
So let's think about the implications if the Most High gave a law that can't be kept. So first of all, Deuteronomy 28, we read this earlier, but just to remind you, now it shall be if you diligently obey Yahweh your Elohim, being careful to do all his commandments, which I am commanding you today, that Yahweh your Elohim will put you high above all the nations of the earth and all these blessings will come to you and reach you if you obey Yahweh your Elohim. And he goes on to say, you'll be blessed uh, with your children that come out of uh, the, your wives' wombs. You'll be blessed with uh, the animals and the fruit of the earth and all these. So he, if, if the law is unattainable, then these blessings would be unattainable. Then later on, he says, it shall come, this is also Deuteronomy 28 here, verse 15, but it shall come about if you do not obey Yahweh your Elohim to be careful to follow all his commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed will you be in the city and cursed will you be in the country. Cursed will be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed will be the children of your womb and the produce of your ground, the newborn of your herd and the offspring of your flock. Cursed will you be when you come in. When, cursed will you be when you come in and cursed will you be when you go out. Yahweh will send against you curses, panic, and rebuke in everything that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly on account of the evil deeds because you have abandoned me. Yahweh will make the plague cling to you until he has eliminated, eliminated you from the land where you are entering to take possession of it. Yahweh will strike you with a consumption, inflammation, fever, feverish heat, and with a sword, and with blight, and with mildew, and will pursue you until you perish. So if the Most High gave them a, a, a law that nobody could keep and it was too hard, then he dest them for failure and for curses and he would be completely unfair because it goes on to say if you if you walk away from my commandments and you don't do them you will suffer starvation to the to the point where you'll be so hungry you'll eat your own children and so people it's, it's so people that continue that to preach that doctrine that say that Elohim gave Israel a law that nobody can keep and it was too hard is it, it, they're they're saying that the Most High was unfair, is an unfair judge, and, gave, and and basically cursed them because they're like, because if he gave it to them and said, if you don't do this, you'll be cursed, he basically just cursed them and says, well, I'm just going to annihilate you because I'm giving you a law you can't keep. What are we saying here? Daniel 9, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus, uh, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed the books and the number of the years which was revealed as the word of Yahuwah to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, seven years. So I gave my attention to Yahuwah Elohim to seek him by prayer and pleading with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to Yahuwah my Elohim and confessed and said, O Yahuwah, the great and awesome Elohim who keeps his covenant and faithfulness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Okay, so we can associate. So this is Daniel who associates loving him and keeping the commandments. We have sinned. We have done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our leaders, our fathers, and all the, pro the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, Yahuwah, but to us open shame as it is this day to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel who are nearby and those who are far away in all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds which they have committed against you. That's why they were spread. He knew the promises. Open shame belongs to us, Yahuwah, to our kings, to our leaders, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To Yahuwah, our Elohim, belongs compassion and forgiveness because we have rebelled against him. And we have not obeyed the voice of Yahuwah, our Elohim, to walk in his teachings, or you'll see here, his Torah, his laws, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has violated your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has gushed forth on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of Elohim, because we have sinned against him. So he has confirmed his words, which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great disaster for under the entire heaven. There has not been done anything like what was done in Jerusalem, just as it is written in the law of Moses. All this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of Yahuwah Elohim by turning from our wrongdoing and giving attention to your truth, which is the Torah. So Yahuwah has kept the disaster in store and brought it on us. For Yahuwah our Elohim is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. So Daniel rightly says in his prayer that this thing happened to them because they walked away from his law. He didn't, he didn't say, ah, oh, you know, we, we have mercy on us. None of us could keep your law. It's too hard. Nobody could do it. That's not what he said. 
Jeremiah 16, 3 through 11, for this is what Yahweh says concerning the sons and daughters born in this place and concerning their mothers who give birth to them. This is talking about Jerusalem and their fathers who their fathers who father them in this land, they will die of deadly diseases. They will not be mourned or buried. They will be like dung on the surface of the ground, and they will perish by sword and famine, and their dead bodies will become food for the birds of the sky and for the animals of the earth. For this is what Yahweh says, Do not enter a house of mourning, or go to mourn or to console them. For I have withdrawn my peace from this people, declares Yahweh, and my favor and compassion. Both great people and small will die in this land. They will not be buried. People will not mourn for them nor will anyone make cuts on himself or have his head shaved for them people will not break bread in mourning for them to comfort anyone for the dead nor give them a cup of consolation to drink for anyone's father or mother moreover you shall not go into a house of feasting to sit with them to eat and drink for this is what Yahuwah Sebaot the Elohim of Israel says behold I am going to eliminate them from this place before your eyes and your time the voice of rejoicing and the voice of joy the voice of the groom and the, the voice of the bride now it will happen that when you tell this people all these words they will say, say to you for what reason Reason has Yahweh declared all this great disaster against us? And what is our wrongdoing or our sin that we have committed against Yahweh our Elohim? Then you are to say to them, It is because your forefathers have abandoned me, declares Yahweh, and have followed other gods and served and worshipped them, but they have abandoned me and have not kept my law. This is and the reason I'm saying this is that he kept warning them. He had long, long suffering and passion over hundreds of years. Calm back, calm back. These are, the, these are the warnings I've given you. If you don't come back, I will destroy you. All the warnings I told you about in my Torah, if you don't do it. And he wouldn't be a just Elohim if he gave them a law that they could not do. It wouldn't be right. Deuteronomy 30. So it will be when all of these things that have come upon you, the blessing and the curse. So he first blessed them because they kept the law and then they cursed them because they didn't keep the law, which I have placed before you. And you call them to mind in all the nations where Yahweh Elohim has scattered you. This is the time frame we're at now. We're scattered abroad all through the four corners of the earth. And you return to Yahweh Elohim and obey him with all your heart and soul in accordance with everything that I am commanding you today, you and your sons. And this is where we're at now. Where those are people coming out of all these falsehoods and coming back and be like, hey, you know what? We can do this. Are any of us perfect? Especially when we first come back? No. But it says the righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. But the whole thought process of the law is done away with, we walk away from it, uh, it's too hard, nobody can do it, uh, uh, Messiah came to do it, so to do it for us, so we don't have to do it. These are all lies. And I'm going to pr prove it to you right now, 100%, by what the word says that we can do his Torah. Then Yahweh, so when we come back to his commandments, then Yahweh your Elohim will restore you from your captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahweh your Elohim has gathered you. This is the gathering. This is the, the second exodus or the, the, the what people call the rapture. The rapture is not just the rapture of the whole church of everybody just that confesses Messiah and then lives a terrible life. Oh, yeah, yeah, everybody's going. No. He's going to gather his righteous people. If any of your scattered countrymen are at the ends of the earth, from there Yahweh your Elohim will gather you, and from there will he bring you back. Yahweh your Elohim will bring you into the land which your, which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will be good to you and make you more numerous than your fathers. Moreover, Yahweh your Elohim will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants to love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And Yahweh your Elohim will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you and persecuted you. And you will again obey Yahweh and follow all his commandments, which I am commanding you today. So he's talking about in our time that there's some people who are going to return and to follow his commandments. Then Yahweh your Elohim will prosper you abundantly in every work of your hand. It goes a lot about what we're talking about today. And the children of your womb, and the offspring of your cattle, and the produce of the ground. For Yahweh will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey Yahweh your Elohim to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, the Torah. If you turn to Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. Listen, listen carefully. For those people that still think the law is too hard and nobody can do it. For this commandment which I am commanding you today is not too 
difficult for you. The Torah even says it's not too difficult for us, nor is it far away. It is not in heaven that you would say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you would say, who will cross the sea for us and get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it. On the crunch, on the contrary, the word is very near, near you and in your mouth and in your heart that you may follow it. Paul repeats this. He quotes this in Romans. See, I have placed before you today life and happiness and death and adversity in that I am commanding you today to love Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments so that you may live and become numerous and that Yahweh your Elohim may bless you in the land where you're entering to take possession of it. So he says clearly by his own Torah that it's not too hard, that people can do it. Let's look at some New Testament stuff. 1 John 5, 1 through 3. Whoever believes that Yahusha Hamashiach is that Messiah, Yahusha is Messiah, is born of Elohim. And everyone that loves him that begat loves him also that is begotten of him. Good old KGV. By this we know, listen, by this we know that we love the children of Elohim. So this is how we love our neighbor. When we love Elohim and keep his commandments. For this is the love of Elohim that we keep his commandments. And listen, listen carefully, and his commandments are not grievous or in other translations they're not burdensome they're not hard they're actually a blessing and a joy and when you actually walk it out you're like wow i'm walking in the ancient path and then we find that rest for our souls exodus 20 verse 6 and showing mercy unto them unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments this is how we love him matthew 11 28 through 30 come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest remember messiah is the word of yahuwah Take my yoke upon you. This is the word talking to you. And learn of me. This is the word talking to you. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rests on your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's talking about his ways. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21 through 24, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Master, how is it that you will manifest yourself unto us and not unto the world? Yehusha answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode, our home with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. So what are the sayings of Messiah? M Matthew 5. 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And when you look at this word fulfill, let's actually just let's look at it together. You don't have to take my word for it. Let's look at it together. Let's look at the word fulfill. Because here's what people teach today. Don't think that I am come to abolish the law of the prophets. I am not come to abolish, but to abolish. To fulfill. To make full, to fill up, to fill to the full, to cause to abound, to furnish or supply liberally, to fill to the top so that nothing shall be wanting, full measure to the brim, to carry into effect, to bring to realization. Listen to this. This is the best one. To fulfill, i.e. to cause Elohim's will as made known in the law, to be obeyed as it should be. So again, this is the sayings of Messiah. This is, this is literally the word of Yahweh speaking to us. Think, don't think that I am come to destroy the law, the Torah, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to bring to full realization, to fully preach, to, have, to show you how to obey it as you, to, to show you how to obey it as it should be. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, which is still here, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now remember, when the king in Revelation 11, 8, I think, Revelation 11, there's a point where it says, no, not 11, 8. Here we go. Uh, Revelation eleven fifteen, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, "The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our master, of our Yahuwah, and of His Messiah, and He shall reign forever." So remember, there's going to be New Jerusalem, there's going to be New Jerusalem, and then outside New Jerusalem are going to be the nations, but all those have become His kingdom. So let's read that again. 
Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So that doesn't mean even though you break his commandments and do so purposefully that you're going to get inside of the walls of New Jerusalem. But whoever shall do and teach them, he shall, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. It's commonly taught that the scribes and the Pharisees uh, were all about walking the law. Messiah himself says you don't keep the Torah. What did they keep? They kept their own man-made oral tradition. Same thing that's uh, going on in modern, modern Judaism today. Look at modern rabbinical Judaism. It, they, they're, they're the, it's the same teachings from the, the Pharisees of old. These scribes and Pharisees at the time of Messiah were more, were more interested in, in the laws of their man-made traditions that made of no effect of the commandments. And that's what's happening. And in, in, I'm not judging anybody in the, in the Christian churches today. A lot of, most, there's a lot of good people in, in, the, in the churches that are just being lied to and have not seen the truth. And that's why we need to continue to be a light to people and to share and to show them these scriptures and be like, hey, this is what the Word says. Regardless of what your pastor says, regardless of what... Um, Bible co Bible college teaches, regardless of what seminary teaches, this is what the, the word says. And the Most High never commanded Sunday. He never commanded Christmas. Matter of fact, he said, don't do these things. He commanded the Sabbath. He commanded the feast days. He, ma he commanded clean eating. He commanded many things. And guess what? When you walk in them, they're awesome. So, anyways, we're going to finish up here. Uh, we're about done. We're just going to read the rest here, and we're going to be finished with the... Um, testament of his car and every wild beast you shall subdue since you have with you the elohim of heaven and earth and walk with men in singleness of heart and having said these things he commanded his sons that they should carry him up to hebron and bury him there in the cave with his fathers and he stretched out his feet and died in a good old age with every limbs with every limb sound and with strength unabated he slept the eternal sleep and that is the end of the testament of his car i pray brothers and sisters this this is a, may have been a blessing for you in some way talking about the differences of uh, laziness versus hard work, talking about the differences of double-mindedness versus single-mindedness, and talking about how the law, that the Most High did not set us all up for failure, or at least the, set up the Israelites for failure, to give them a law that they could not keep, and then therefore just basically just cursing them without them having any ability to not be cursed. That's not the truth. The truth is he gave them a law that is not burdensome, is not grievous, the, the yoke is easy and the burden is light, and you find rest for your souls. That's the truth. And if you want to learn more about this, you can go to the homepage of Parable of the Vineyard YouTube page, and there is a um, there is a playlist called. Uh, I'll just I'll show it to you. So if you go to um, here. If you want to learn more about keeping the Torah, so if you go to the homepage of Parable of the Vineyard, you come down here, right here, so it says new. Here's how you can catch up quickly. The basics of the way, right here. Uh, this would, oops, I wanted to just click on, I can't even do my own thing here. Oh, here, full, view full playlist. That's what I wanted to click. So yeah, this is the, uh, this is the playlist. This I think may, may help you. Um, this may help you along your journey if you want to learn more if you're like you know what uh, the scripture said what it said uh, maybe some of you out there may be convicted but like, you know what I, I want to start keeping the commandments I've been lied to in my life and I don't want to be lied to anymore I, I, I want to learn how to do this I think this playlist may greatly benefit you I, I pray it does um, so let's pray Father Yahweh Most High in Heaven we just bless you the Elohim of Abraham Yitzchak and Yaakov Father we just thank you for sending us your seed your only begotten Son, Messiah Husha, who came, was the Word and taught us truth, Father. And I pray that the Word spoken today may have pricked or pierced someone's heart, that they may want to keep your ways, O Yah. And even those that already understand to do this, that we can just continue to be refined in your Torah and your truth and in these amazing um, testaments that uh, these great patriarchs left for us, Father. We love you so much. We just ask that you help us to walk in singleness, Father, and not in double-mindedness and not on double-heartedness, and that we'd follow the examples of great men way before us, like Abraham and Moshe and many before us, Father, and David. And Father, we just love you so much, and we thank you, Father, and we just ask that you be our shield and protect us, Father, from all of our enemies, and that, um, oh, as Isaiah 64 says, that, oh, that you'd run the heavens, Father, and you'd come down come and bring judgment to this wicked earth father and bring your people until that time help us to be a light to bring as many people out of darkness into your light as possible give us your ruach hakodesh your holy spirit father to guide us in yahushua's mighty name amen hallelujah shabbat shalom brothers and sisters um we'll uh, see the torah portion here uh shortly so with that let's do one song we'll do uh let's let's sing about seeking his face 
שבת שלום. of your son so we could have hope taught us how to walk in spirit and in truth he is the vine to him we bear fruit your words a lamp unto our feet our hearts desire with every single beat your Torah inside us commandments we know till that creature fall we wait until it's gone when you said seeking my My heart said unto you Your face will not see And sound at Shofar And go with the shout We'll sing you praises Praises to our King And clap your hands All His people And sing with Don't delay Parking to his people His doctrine drops his rain Keeping the commandments Lest you walk in vain His Torah is no burden No matter what you told Sweeter than honey And worth more than gold When you said Seeking my face My heart said unto you Your face will not see And sound That shofar and go with the shout We'll sing you praises Praises to our King And clap your hands All His people And sing with joy To our Elohim Standing on Mount Zion singing that new song And is chosen to him we belong Worthy is the Lamb for he who was slain Made us kings and priests by him we shall reign Open ye the gates for those that keep the truth You'll give us lasting peace of minds that stayed on you Striving to shine bright like your menorah Walking in the way, the truth, your Torah I'll never go back Never go Hello